it's awesome to be with you guys here on this Wednesday afternoon to talk pricing and business model. Who's fired up? Yeah. All right, thank you. My personal approach to preparation was I just ate an entire plate of the chocolate covered matzah. Uh, so I'm running on rainbow sprinkle power uh, for now. Uh, so as Jeff said, we're going to talk about pricing and business models. I'm Jason. I'm an operating partner at A16Z. My partner in crime today is Maggie, who runs our go-to-market team. And uh, so we're going to divide and conquer on this topic. I'm going to talk first about uh, six questions that all of you should be asking yourselves as founders and CEOs about your business model and pricing. Maggie's going to take us through some case studies and then also talk about some additional uh, pricing considerations that you want to think about. Uh, and let me, let me sort of set the context for what we'll cover in the next little bit. So if you, if you reflect on the, uh, on the kinds of presentations and discussions and content that you all have seen before, like words that I would use to describe them are you know, very visionary, super intellectual, strategic, inspirational. This is going to be none of that. Uh, so the image that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this is of this, of this toolbox. Uh, if we do our job today, what we want to give you is a set of frameworks and examples and heuristics. So as you think about your own business model and how you price your products, you can, you can reach into this toolbox for your mind, find the right tool, tinker with your pricing, and come up with an approach that, uh, that's going to work for you and your product and your business. Uh, and so uh, let me just walk through sort of what the six questions are that uh, I think you all want to be asking yourselves. So question number one, what are all of the different ways I could price and which approach makes the, sen the, the most sense for my product and my market? And the, the reason that uh, I'm emphasizing the word all here is that I think for each of you, right, there's, some, there's, there's sort of some set of pricing heuristics or approaches that are going to logically make sense to you. But given that you're so early, if you sort of take a step back and think through every way that you could price your product, every approach that you could take, you may unlock a combination of pricing models that are going to lead you to a much, much more customer-aligned pricing model that, uh, that is going to help you maximize your, your business and your market opportunity. And so let me just walk through a number of different ways you can uh, think about this. So one would be user-based pricing. So right, this is a very common SaaS and enterprise-based uh, pricing approach. You can think of how Slack prices or sales, Salesforce prices, you count the number of people within an organization who are using your product. You charge them a monthly or a quarterly or an annual fee. The more people within the org that use your product, the more revenue you generate. Typically, you'll also, you know, as you, as you get to larger and larger organizations, you'll introduce volume discounts so that you have know, the price on a per user basis for a thousand users. Obviously, it's more in terms of nominal dollars, but on a, on a per user basis, they're getting a discount than if it was just a 10 user uh, organization. Next is, uh, is usage-based pricing, right? And if you think of the public cloud providers, AWS, GCP, Azure, this is something that, you know, that they've made super common and well understood. The more compute, storage, bandwidth, GPU that you use, the more that you're uh, paying them. And th this approach tends to work really well when you have you know, what, what I'd describe as a consumptive product, meaning the more people use it, uh, both the more value they get and the more underlying infrastructure uh, expense you have in, uh, in providing that. And so this can work really well in that, uh, in that approach. Uh, Feature-based, this, this is actually one that's come up a ton in the conversations that I've had with each of you, right? So you're all thinking about, well, okay, I've got you know, some users, some customers who are developers and they're just getting started and they're maybe like a three-person startup, but I've got a lot of interest from uh, a big enterprise or a much larger, more established company who wants to use what I have. I don't want to charge them all the same price. You know, how can I segregate? And, and a you know, feature-based way, think of it as like a good, better, best, or you know, freemium pro enterprise type of offerings where you put different capabilities into different buckets that are going to appeal to different users and price them differently uh, is a really good way to orient around that. And, and some things to think about are, you know, particularly for your enterprise tier, which is what you want to be uh, the most, most expensive, most valuable, things that tend to work really, really well 
in that is uh, you know enterprises love to pay for better support uh, you know because the, the old saying of like you know nobody ever got fired for buying IBM although today you probably would get fired for buying IBM like you know they want they enterprises tend to want the all singing all dancing like best version of what you have to offer because uh, while they want capabilities they also want to like reduce their exposure and risk so you can put a lot of like extra special capabilities into that bucket. Uh, Value-based pricing is one that I think can actually apply really well to crypto that, that not a lot of people think about. So what I mean by value-based is imagine that you're uh, a new product in a new market uh, offering a set of capabilities that, uh, that historically companies or, or groups have had to build themselves or, or do themselves. Um, a, a really powerful way to price is if you can come in with your offering and say, well, like here's a, a ton of work or a ton of risk uh, or just a breakout set of things that's going to take you know your customer's business to the next level, uh, and and by buying our service, you're going to save a bunch of money or make a bunch of money. You can often use that as an umbrella pricing model. So at a, at a startup I did now uh, now over a decade ago, it was called uh, it was actually where. Uh, Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen came from before they did A16Z. It was an enterprise software company called Opsware. Uh, we were doing what was called at the time data center automation software, and it was it was automation software to make uh, system administrators and network engineers and and storage administration administrators more efficient. And and we were doing this at a time it was you know just post 9/11, post the dot com crash, and uh, and everybody was looking at how could they save money. Uh, on, on their IT and their data center operations. And so our approach is that we would come in and we would say, well, you know, to, to run an application like this, it today takes you, uh, you know, 20 system administrators. If you use our automation tools, you can do the same work with two. So you get, you know, like a net savings of 90% in terms of human labor. And so that would be our, our pricing model. And actually another company that has done this really well is, uh, is Palantir, uh, kind of in the defense and intelligence uh, space, you know, they're they're often replacing huge armies of, of consultants, and so they're able to capture some of that value for themselves. And this this tends to be like a very high margin, very high value way of pricing if you have an effective way of communicating that to your customers. Uh, transaction based, you know, this, this is one that in crypto and blockchain a lot of people are looking at and doing. I'd say the the more traditional company that's done a great job of this is Stripe, right? Where if you use their payment API, they're taking a small, track, uh, small fraction of every transaction that goes through the system. Um, I think that this will work great in crypto over time. The one caution that I would have for you today is that uh, you know, the, the transaction volumes across most networks tends to be sort of so small today that you want to, you, you want to have fairly realistic uh, understanding and estimates of, of how much that transaction volume is going to grow, such that if you're taking, you know, say, like 0.15% of every transaction on a network, if you actually do the math, and I'll talk about this uh, in just a few minutes, you're going to see that the number of transactions on that network has to get pretty darn large for you to ultimately have an interesting business. So it's something you want to be cognizant of. Uh, revenue share, this is something that, that Google did really, really well in the early days of the business where, you know, when their district, before sort of Google.com uh, and Chrome were the dominant ways that people searched, right, Google would pay for placement to be the default search provider on Yahoo, on AOL, uh, on, you know, AT&T and Verizon when, uh, when mobile first became a thing. Uh, and, and it was a very customer aligned business model, right, because the more searches that someone did you know, via Yahoo, but using Google, the more revenue both Google and Yahoo would, uh, would earn. And so th this is nice when it works in that uh, it, it allows you to share an upside with your, with your customers and distribution partners. Services-based, this is like, you know, classic consulting and professional services. Well, I wouldn't recommend that you adopt this as your, as your dominant approach to pricing. This is a, this is a um, you know, sort of great approach you can take when you have a customer who wants a feature uh, or like think of it as like a custom report or, uh, or something that's not in your mainstream product roadmap. You, you're not imminently going to ship it, but the customer needs it in order for you to close the deal. One way that you can bridge that gap is by charging them a nominal 
uh, professional services fee to either you know, accelerate or custom build that feature for them. So sort of you, you get compensated for it and you give your customer the thing that they need to get excited about your product. This can be sort of a really useful accelerator and deal closer for other things you're doing. Uh, dynamic pricing, you know, Uber, Lyft, uh, airlines have done a good job of this, and this is the, the idea of, right, you know, your, your pricing may vary depending on, uh, on volume and demand at a given time, and so depending on your product or service, this can be interesting as well. And then last but not least, just sort of like a general uh, catch-all bucket of, you know, subscription-based businesses tend to be really, really powerful for a couple different reasons, but, but one of them, right, is that if you have subscribers, you effectively can lock in uh, compounding growth for a very, very long period of time because you don't need to uh, you know, net recreate your business every single quarter or every single year. You're growing on top of a stable revenue base uh, that you have. So when, when a subscription model makes sense for you and your customers, it can be super helpful and powerful. All right. Question number two, am I charging the right price? So one a conversation I've had with many of you is you're brand new, your product's in beta, you don't know if you're charging too much, too little. Uh, there's a really actually good way to go test this, which is that, uh, that you can do an early A-B test of your pricing. And, and the way that I would encourage you to think about it, you know, particularly for, for those of you who are engaging directly with prospective customers, uh, you, can, you can pick a small prospective customer cohort, say five customers, and, and you know, say that you're doing feature-based pricing, so you've got uh, you know, uh, you know, basic, uh, basic premium and enterprise, price uh, basic, basic for, for this first cohort, basic at X, premium at Y, enterprise at Z, uh, and then take a second customer cohort about the same size and do 5X, 5Y, 5Z, so literally create a 5x or a 3x or maybe even a 10x differential between your, your customer, your, your prospective customers, pitch them both the same thing and see what happens. Uh, and, and, you know, if you close 100% of the, uh, the cohort who you pitch at 5 or 10x, that tells you that you've got, you know, probably a lot more, a lot more uh, pricing headroom than you thought you had. And, and what I'll tell you from having done this a lot of times and seeing hundreds of customers is it's much, much more common for an early startup to underprice rather than overprice. So experiment here, have some fun, and, uh, and see what you learn. And, and, and there, there is like a great escape hatch in all of this, which is if, you're, if your higher priced customer uh, cohort you know, just sort of like throws up on what you're, what you're proposing to them, you can say, well, you know, you guys are special, you're early, we really want your business. So we're going to, as, as an introductory offer, we'll give you the XYZ pricing. Um, you know, the one, the one mistake you, you want to avoid here, right, is that when you're doing that price discovery, don't publicly publish your price list on your, on your website, right? If, they can, if, if someone can go look at your website, see what you say you're charging, and you present them a different price list, that's obviously going to uh, really foul your, your A-B testing. So, so, you know, resist the temptation to, to make your pricing public until you zero in more on what, uh, what you think your actual pricing is going to be. Uh, question number three, are there opportunities for me to price discriminate within my product offering? You know, absolutely. I, I talked about this a little bit on feature-based pricing, right? But you want, to, you want to think deeply about how you can segment your product offering, how you can segment your customer base, and the better job you can do of putting capabilities in uh, nicely grouped and defined buckets that are easy for your customers to understand, each, which come with, each of which come with a slightly different price. Uh, the better, better opportunity you're going to have to, you know, capture many, many, many uh, brand new businesses who want to experiment with your product uh, and, and get to know it before they commit. Uh, and also you'll be able to capture, you know, very large established players, you know, both like kind of the big guys in the, in the crypto space as well as more traditional enterprises by, by offering a feature set tailored to them. Question four, uh, how do other products and services in adjacent markets price? So th this is like what I would call a cheat code, right? If you're, if you're starting out, you don't really know what to do, and there's another market that you can think of as almost uh, a substitute for what you do. Actually, where is the Chain Patrol team? Yeah, right, uh, right there, right? So, so if, you, if you think about what Chain Patrol's doing, 
you know, they're offering a, a new native service for uh, essentially scam protection and takedowns uh, in crypto, which is, which is amazing and it's gonna be great. Um, but there's a whole existing Web2 market for the same kind of things, like you know, uh, basically fraud defender and other things that will, that will take down uh, companies and services that are doing malicious things. So if you're, if you're chain patrol and you wanna figure out sort of what, what uh, ballpark you should price in, you can go look at all the Web2 companies that are doing a similar kind of thing and use that as a way to guide. Yeah, actually, same thing with, with Bello, right? Um, you know, you guys are, are offering an analytics service. There are lots and lots and lots of, you know, conversion-oriented uh, Web2 services, analytics services out there. Uh, you can use that as a way to uh, map the train that you're operating in. Question five. The next two, so if, if, you, if you remember only two parts, only two questions, I hope you remember all six questions, but if you remember only two from, from my talk, uh, five and six are where you want to pay attention. So, Number five, do my unit economics work, right? So you want to make sure super, super early in your company that you have a margin structure that if you execute well, you get massive market share, you build a great product, like is actually going to lead to a business that works for you. Uh, and let me give you a counter example of that from my prior company, uh, my prior employer, Google, right? So about a decade ago, uh, Google was riding high, you know, thought they could do no wrong, like everything the company had done today just like really, really, really worked. Uh, and so they decided to get into the high-speed internet access business with Google Fiber, where they were, you know, amazing service, right? You know, gigabit ethernet to your door, uh, like before anybody was offering anything like that. And the mentality was like, we're Google, we got this, the laws of gravity don't apply to us. Uh, and so, you know, the company invested billions and billions of dollars in, uh, in rolling this out, like first in Kansas City, then to a few more markets. Uh, and unfortunately, what turned out to be the case was, it doesn't matter if you're Google, if you're Verizon, uh, if, you're, if you're a local infrastructure provider, like the cost of jackhammering a sidewalk uh, so, that you can, so that you can lay high-speed fiber optic cable and then like rolling trucks uh, to everybody's homes to like set up the service, it doesn't matter who you are, that costs a lot of money. And so it turned out that you know, before Google knew it, they were billions of dollars uh, into a market that was, in, in, into a product line that was just never going to work for the company. So like, don't make that mistake. Make sure that you can profitably deliver your service. And, and you can for sure you know, make, um, make guesstimates and extrapolations that things are going to change and converge over time. But, but it turns out that you know, particularly in this economic and fundraising environment, the business model of, you know, we lose money on every customer, but we're gonna make it up in volume is not gonna work very well for you. Uh, so don't, don't do that one. Uh, and then last but not least, this is something that nobody does, but everybody should. Uh, if I imagine that my market was going to grow 10 to 100x, so one to two orders of magnitude from where it is today, and I captured 100% market share using my current pricing, would I end up with an interesting business? And this, this is like a super simple Google Sheets exercise that you can do right after this session. And the reason that I encourage you uh, to do this is because you know, the, the conventional wisdom right, is like, oh gosh, like startups are really hard, really hope it works, like failure would be terrible, uh, and, and you know, I'm gonna do everything not to fail. I, I would argue to you there is a much, much, much worse outcome than failure, which is that you pour you know, four, five, six, seven years of your heart, your mind, your soul, uh, your employees' lives into building what you're, what you're building. You, know, you, ra you successfully raise capital and you execute perfectly, but then you get to the end of your journey and you're like, oh shit. Like, like the, you know, everything, look, even though I did it all right, the end market, the end size of my opportunity just isn't big enough and interesting enough for me to have built a, a business that was worthy of everything that I put into it. And, and just to like close with an example that, that, that has a happy ending here, there's a, there uh, was a layer two project. If I said the name, you would all you know, immediately know who it was that I was uh, working with. And they had like a very you know, elegant way of thinking about how they were gonna do a transaction rev share uh, on all this cool stuff that they were gonna be doing. And it was like super customer aligned. And it was, be, it was gonna be amazing. And I, and I had them, 
uh, do this exercise, and, and within about 15 minutes, the realization was, oh my gosh, we would need about 70x the daily transaction volume of, of Ethereum on our network to have a business model that made us break even. So like, you know, they'd have to be 70 times larger than Ethereum is today just for their relatively small team to be able to be self-sustaining. So the good news is when they realized that, and they, they just had literally never done the math before. So when they did that, they you know, changed everything, made a few modifications, were able to keep going with most, most things. They just sort of changed their pricing and like everything, everything worked out where you know, it kind of won 1,000th the volume, they were able to end up with a pretty good, uh, pretty good business. So my, my plea to you is do this exercise so you don't end up uh, regretting it four, five, six years into the future. With that, uh, let me hand it over to Maggie. Thank you, Jason. So I'll be talking through pricing strategies for three types of business models. The first is a marketplace model, the second is a SaaS business, and then the third would be a business that offers some sort of downside protection. So in a marketplace model, you have buyers and sellers, and the marketplace itself exists because there's some sort of friction in getting these buyers and sellers together. And so in a marketplace, you can really charge some combination of the buyers and or the sellers. And so I've put that on this grid here, and I'll just walk through from the inside out what this could look like. So when would you not charge a buyer or a seller? Well, this seems quite straightforward, but when you're looking to grow the marketplace, you don't want to have friction in onboarding either of these groups. And so if you don't have enough buyers, you probably wouldn't charge them. Same thing if you didn't have enough sellers. The next category is a one-time charge. So in this example, you could think about something like a merch marketplace where the merch is uh, really popular and everyone wants access to it. And so you're actually token gating this marketplace. You're making buyers purchase a token in order to get that access. You could do the same thing for the sellers. You could basically make sure their incentives are aligned if you have this curated marketplace and you want them to have a token in order to even gain access to sell into it. The next model or the next category is recurring. And this could come in two forms. One is transaction-based and the second would be subscription-based. And this is what we most typically see in marketplaces, which is why I've put the little yellow dot there. So transaction-based, we're all very used to this. When you purchase an item, you typically pay a transaction fee. Uh, but that fee can actually change. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same for every single transaction in the marketplace. And so you'll oftentimes see marketplaces charging reduced fees if the transaction value is higher. They might charge different fees for different categories. And as we've seen recently with some of the, kind of the marketplace battles, they can kind of move this fee up and down uh, to better map out some of the, the needs that they have on the competitive front. Now, a subscription-based model might apply if you have a marketplace where it's actually hard to estimate the net value of the transaction. And so an example here might be something like a marketplace for NFT holders where it gives them opportunities to commercialize their NFTs through some sort of IP licensing. And so in this case, you're serving up these opportunities, but oftentimes it's hard to estimate the net value of the transaction. Most of these deals probably won't even close. And so you could think about offering something like a subscription where they're getting recurring access to the deals on this marketplace, but you aren't responsible for the, the net transaction value. On the seller side, we often see this as a listing fee. So this is essentially a fee to list a certain item. But sellers could also pay for things like premium placement or other co-marketing. And so you have these value-added features that a seller might want. In a SaaS example, so you're selling to these archetypes. You're selling to individuals, then teams, then enterprises. And so if you think about, when you look at most SaaS companies, they almost all follow this, this same logic. They have this entry tier, and so that's their base tier, their free tier. They then have their standard tier, and then they go to this kind of power or enterprise tier. And if you think about an individual, they're essentially going up these tiers based on a combination of increased usage and increased features. And these might map, but they don't have to exactly correlate. You can think about increased usage being on a continuum, so they're using, and you really need to figure out where to cut off those usage at each of these tiers. And the same thing with features, and so that's that kind of packaging element. And so to what Jason was saying earlier, this is really where a lot of the work goes into it, because these things may look neatly packaged here, but the work that you're doing with all those six questions is really to understand how you're pricing these different tiers and reallocating and kind of testing between them, because oftentimes what's in these will change over time. 
So an example from our portfolio, Alchemy, they offer Web3 development tools. You can see here they have their free tier, so it offers a certain number of compute units, and it also offers a certain number of features. They then want you to move into their growth tier, which offers more compute units and more features. And I would say that this is a bit of a, a B2C or B2D business to developer motion, where it's essentially self-serve. So someone could come to the site, they sign up for the free tier, they then upgrade to the growth tier, they might then downgrade back to the free tier, and they could leave, all without you ever potentially speaking to them. And this is actually very different from an enterprise model. In an enterprise model, the sales motion is likely a lot more custom. So you are talking to the enterprise, you're negotiating a custom contract, you have these features, and, and it's really a different sales motion where you really do need some sort of sales resourcing against it. And so it may look clean and similar, and you have these three tiers lined up, but when you think about how you're allocating your sales resourcing, the first one is this much more self-serve motion. What does that look like from a sales process? And then the second one is, is much more of kind of that white glove approach of this enterprise motion. Another example from our portfolio is Nansen. So Nansen offers Web3 analytics. And in this case, they're taking an individual and they're moving the individual up from standard to VIP to alpha. And this is all with an increased number of features. They also offer length-based discounting, so you can get discounts if you pay quarterly or annually, and they also offer things like trials. So the third type of business is, is a business offering some sort of insurance or downside protection. This could be against hacks, it could be against scams. And the stakeholders in this case are the individual NFT holders as one, and then the NFT creator as another. And so that could include the creator, it could include an employee of the creator, that company, it could include the community manager. It's really a different set of stakeholders. And the upside and downside for each of these sets of stakeholders is actually a little bit different. So for an individual holder, the downside is quite clear. If their wallet is hacked, their assets are gone. And you can measure this because you know the value of the assets in their wallet. You can calculate the expected probability of a hack happening because you have all this on-chain data of hacks. You know the value that your service brings, so you can do some sort of estimation of taking that estimate X percent and taking it to Y percent. And then it's actually a very straightforward calculation of the expected value here, where you can multiply those numbers and get some sort of expected value of loss. And then you could theoretically charge the holder a premium based on this. What I do think is interesting is psychology here, because most holders probably think that they are less likely to get hacked than the next holder. And so even though you should have this this number and this premium, you're likely potentially charging less than that just because of this psychological effect. For the NFT creator, they actually don't have a direct impact if the holder is hacked, right? This isn't something that they're losing revenue from, but they have a cost to fix this. So potentially this came from something in their Discord or it was a Twitter link that got sent out, and so they need to repair this. There's also reputational considerations. So if you're in a community and everyone's all getting hacked, that's not a great NFT community. Um, and to Jason's point, there are likely alternative options. So are they paying for security? Are there Web3 security, Web2 security? Kind of what else are they using and what else are they paying for? This is something that they've likely looked into. And then if you're thinking finally about how to differentiate, how would I sell into NFT communities? You could differentiate in a few different ways. So one could just be the number of holders, right? So the number of holders of NFTs, and that's a measure of the community size. Um, but that might not be the best way because the number of holders might be changing. The other one could be market cap. So you essentially could take the floor price or the average price of an NFT, multiply it by the number of holders, and you get a rough estimate of total value and total assets. And then the third would just be the type of NFT community. So potentially it's an art NFT community or a sports NFT community. Maybe they have different factors and they have different considerations in what they would want in the service. And just wanted to close on some additional pricing considerations. So the first one is, if you're pricing to enter a market and you already have a competitor in that market, you are likely pricing under the competitor, right? You're just trying to get market share. And so once you're entering that market, I think the danger is that you stay at that underpricing for too long. Customers are much more sensitive to small increases in price. And so once you have that market penetration, it's really important to quickly raise the prices back to parity. A number of you asked about beta pricing versus launch pricing. I personally think that the role of a beta is to feature test, and you want to understand price sensitivity, but you actually don't have to take exactly your beta pricing framework and make that your same launch pricing framework. These can be different things, right? The, the role of the beta is experimentation. The second one is more of a uniquely Web3 uh, issue, and it's essentially exchange risk. And so if you think about your pricing and matching your, your income against your expenses, 
you might be pricing in ETH, but all your expenses are in fiat. So there's some sort of hedging you need to do in order to maintain that parity. In terms of being customer friendly, maybe you want to offer the ability to accept basically everything. So you're accepting lots of different cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, ETH, stable coins, and fiat. But from a, a management perspective on the back end, uh, just understand that you'll have to hedge that out. And there's just certain considerations that you'll want to think about. Um, one potential way to, to kind of address this is with things like pricing oracles and others. And then finally, I think this is kind of my biggest point to, to hammer home, is don't be in too much of a rush to lock in your pricing model. This is something that's incredibly important to get right. And so it's OK to set up these custom pricings and, and really work with customers in a more customized way instead of just putting something out there. I think it's, it's just really important to, to take your time and not you know, rush to put something in place that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so that's it. Happy to take any questions. But hopefully that provides a, a practical pricing framework for you. Thank you both. Very, very useful session. Um, so we are uh, building like a B2B sales type product. Um, and we are uh, not starting with tiering. We're just having a flat price. And then we were planning on looking at how users interact with different features to then figure out tiering. Um, I'd be intrigued to, to get your perspective on that. Because we looked at uh, all these, these three tiers, but these were all of mature businesses. And so I wonder what they did at the start. So I, I, I mean, I, I think you can definitely give that a try. I think that my, my bias would be towards taking your, your best shot and best guess at an initial set of tiered features. And, and the reason why is that uh, if you do that, you, you then, you know, in, in, a, in a customer conversation, a prospective customer conversation, you have places that you can move. You, you know, you can, you can go to a, a lower price offering with less features if they uh, are pushing back on the price point. You can give them more if they want more and they have the ability to pay. If you just, um, if you, if you just have one offering, you sort of, you, you lose the opportunity to acquire a signal about what might work for you long term. So I, I, I'd say my, my bias would be, you know, be, be knowingly impre imprecise uh, as a way to acquire data and intelligence on your, on your prospective customers. I don't know, what do you? Yeah, I mean, I would say have at least two tiers. Um, very rarely, almost never have I seen kind of that one tier work out. And so for a slightly different reason, I think it's important to start that differentiation early. Cool. Hi, Jay from uh, Ether ID. Thank you for, very much for the talk. Um, I, I was curious how uh, for a, a lot of us, we're, we're still in the process of finding product market fit. So like how uh, you think of like, should we first find product market fit before iterating on the pricing model? Should we try to do both? Um, how, do, how do you calibrate that? So I think it's something that you can do at the same time, um, but ultimately you want to get to that product market fit first because a lot of that does determine kind of what you can charge in terms of pricing. Um, so I think I would prioritize the former, um, but have an eye to you know what are what are kind of some ways in which you can test out willingness to pay. Building on what Maggie said, right? Your th think of your pricing as some of the tools and levers that you have in that journey to finding product market fit. Because basically, I mean, what, what you wouldn't want to learn, right, if you find that you know, some meaningful number of people will uh, use your product for free, but if you then you know, want to charge them $5 a month, they all lose interest, that's a useful thing to know earlier rather than later. That's good. Thank you. Hey, guys. Emmanuel from Shield. So my question is around when do you bring up pricing, like the timing of bringing up pricing during a sales cycle? Um, and just to give like some more context, we, we've been meeting with a, a certain company where we've had two calls with them so far. The first one was with someone kind of more entry level. The second one was with the head of marketing. And it still seems like we would need one more call um, to kind of get the founder uh, to, to buy into it. So we did bring up pricing with the head of marketing, but I'm just wondering you know, if there's any best practices around like, you know, when you should, you should bring that up? I think my, in my experience, you sort of know it when you see it, right? You, you want to, you don't want to hit them over the head with like, hey, I hope you like what you see and here's how much it's going to cost you, you know, like in the first meeting. You want to get to the point where 
they're clearly interested and they want to know more. And, th and then rather than, I mean, I, I think a good way to introduce it is to, is to say like, hey, it sounds like we could add some value to what you're doing. Would it be helpful if we, if we uh, gave you some pricing? And they can say yes or no. So, you know, when they're, when they're interested, when you think you're, you're winning, you can propose it. And oftentimes they'll ask you, but I think you can, uh, you know, particularly with how early everybody is here, I think you can wait. It doesn't need to be in the first meeting. Yeah, I think in that specific example, I would, if the head of marketing is going to be your advocate, right, they're the ones kind of pitching it, they're excited, um, giving them an indication of what the price is so they can help tee it up for that, you know, founder meeting uh, versus, to Jason's point, just like throwing it out in the meeting and then having everyone, you know, it's the first time they're looking at it. So I would identify kind of who your main stakeholder advocate is, who's getting the benefit, um, helping them understand the pricing, and then they can help tee it up for, you know, the, the decision makers. Got it. Thanks, you. I wanted to ask, um, you know, we've been chatting with, um, you know, a couple of a couple of companies that are also like they're evaluating our offer. They're evaluating yeah. also some like competitive offers, um, and yeah. so, uh, you know, when you're kind of not necessarily in like a bidding war, but you're kind of in this place where you know whoever you're selling to has is a, a, like exploring different like alternatives. Like, is there strategies you found that are effective of one like is there a nice way of asking like what the alternatives are and what the alternative proposals are? Is there ways of like doing that competitive research? Um, and basically how do you find what like the blockers or like what are the, maybe if there's like a step somebody else is offering that maybe you're not thinking of or that maybe just like wasn't in your pitch or something that is making the client lean towards another, um, uh, another potential like, you know, contract with somebody else. Um, I think it, A, depends on how important this customer is to you, right? So you have your lighthouse customers that you'll really do most anything to, to kind of land versus is this kind of a tail end customer that you, you might uh, be hoping to get. And then from there, I would just ask them. I think in, in that sort of situation, they might want to go with you, but there are some either pricing or feature considerations that are the blockers. Um, and, and they will probably tell you, right? They might not tell you exactly who you're competing against, but they might say this competitor is offering X, Y, Z. And just, so just understanding, um, and it oftentimes just starts with asking. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. 100% agree. I would, I, would, I would give you a simple mathematical model to think about. You guys are all better at math than I am, but so we're going to solve this problem together. If you have, like say, in, in, every, in every account, right, that you're going after, like particularly if you're an enterprise uh, sales model, uh, think of it in, in, in every uh, customer, there's uh, a decision maker, a champion, and an end user. Uh, if you convince uh, you know, the end user and your champion uh, to, yeah, that, that you're the right solution, but like not the decision maker, how would you probability assess your, your uh, let, let's say they each have like 33% uh, voting uh, voting authority over to the decision. If you convince like two of the three, what's the probability that you're going to win? Mm -hmm. yeah. Six. Yeah, yeah. No, 66, right? So decision maker, <laughs> decision maker, you know, advocate, user, like if two of the three are like, yeah, we should buy uh, chain patrol, you've got a two thirds chance yeah. of winning. If you convince all of them, uh, you know, pretty much 100% chance, if you convince one of them or none of them, much, much lower. So, so part of your job when you're, when you're talking to the customer is to gather that intelligence. Like you want to, particularly if it's a competitive deal, you want to know how you're doing. You want to know uh, what they like about you, what they don't like about you. You want to uh, you know, know who else they're considering. The best way to figure that out is to ask them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Lucas from Plurgood here. Uh, my question is about marketplaces and how you all think about solving the chicken and egg problem, especially uh, around like bootstrapping liquidity. I mean, I think that that's why, you know, the power of Web3. And so, um, you know, thinking about kind of the token incentive model, are, are you asking about without that or um, with that. potentially with that? Yeah, I mean, that's like a whole other conversation. I feel like, um, you know, we touched on some Web2 and Web3 pricing. I know Scott talked about things like, you know, NFT drop pricing and, and auction mechanics. I feel like bootstrapping marketplaces in Web3 is a whole other topic um, and really goes back to your tokenomics model. And so that's something you know, that some of the other teams might address. We can talk about it offline as well. Okay. 
Uh, this is Ash from Lockbox. We're working on better monitoring and automation for crypto treasuries, so I'd love to chat more about uh, your previous company, Jason, at some point. Um, my question has to do with value-based pri pricing and just generally how you price things when it comes to like these expected value calculations for how much you might be saving someone as far as a risk, uh, especially early on when, let's say, you have one or two customers that you have yet to actually launch. Uh, how much research is ba how much is research based off of like analyzing market conditions for like previous hacks or like previous companies that have lost money, and then how do you balance that with like a very small sample size with like how you've actually deployed, if that makes sense, when you're just super early? Yeah, so I, I would say in the in the early customer set, right, it's largely based on what you can convince them the value is that you're actually delivering. So it's more it's more uh, hypothetical. Uh, either you know savings or it's a hypothetical cost benefit calculus, you know based on publicly available data, and then really what you're trying to do is assemble a large enough first cohort of customers that you can then uh, you know sort of mine their experience to go to the net to the second cohort of customers and say well like with our early cohort this is what we've seen uh, you should believe it too so therefore we're pricing this way but it is definitely uh, you know it's intuition, inspiration, uh, you know, good presentation for that, for that early set of customers. And, and, and so the, the result is that you're probably going to underprice for them, but that's okay. Got it. Thank you. I think we had one more that a team shared with me, which I'll read to you guys. Um, how do you think about pricing within a certain company, like you have one customer, and how do you think about pricing across different projects? Like, is it okay to start at a certain price for one project, but then increase that price over time, or would that be kind of frowned upon? I think it just depends on the nature of the project, and so it, if you're adding kind of custom work, um, what that looks like, and happy to talk about it offline, but I think if it feels like it doesn't make sense, it probably doesn't. So if you're just arbitrarily increasing the price for the same type of work, um, you should have a pretty good reason. But if these projects truly are kind of new builds or, or different things, um, then I think you know, there's absolutely a logical argument to increasing price. And I think if you, if you know that your price is going to have to go up uh, within that same customer over time, like say it's, a, say it's a collection of multiple NFT projects and you're like you know, starting on their smallest brand and you want to move to the larger one, it's logical that, uh, that the bigger ones are going to uh, cost more. And so again, you want to, I, I guess another, another concept I'd leave you guys with is, is you want these pricing and business discussions to be really a two-way street. You're providing information and extracting information uh, so, that, so that you, you know, it's sort of like you want to ultimately end up at a, at a price and a contract and a business relationship that both you and your customer are, are, if not happy with, both, you know, feel as fair value. And the, and the way to do that is through dialogue versus, you know, sort of keeping all the insight and data close to your vest. So in, in the example that you're giving, you, you would very much want to say like, hey, we're giving you this price for this project, but just know that if we move on to bigger things or you want more features or we're going to do this for you, like w the, the, the price is going to need to change. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason right. and Matt. Thank you guys. That was great.